Hello, everybody. Uh, so I, I've been talking about software engineering and software development for, for a while now. And I got involved in a conversation on Twitter uh, a little while ago, uh, and we were talking about the ideas, uh, you know, what, what really makes software engineering an engineering discipline. And somebody said in that conversation to me, that they thought that if we could identify the principles, the deep principles that represented engineering in our discipline, then uh, they would be durable and they would be as true now as they would be in a hundred years time. And that got me thinking. And that's really the, the one idea that's kind of, that's behind my presentation today. I wanna to talk about what software is gonna look like in the future, because I think we've learned some lessons about what works. So one of the way of getting into this is to think about what, you know, if we want to think about what's durable, what sort of ideas stick um, and what's, it, what's going to be true in 100 years time, what, what was true of software development 100 years ago? And if you're anything like me, the, the kind of first thought is that there was nothing at all. There was nothing 100 years ago. And that's nearly true, but it's not quite true. Um, there was this, this was a Hollerith machine. This was a computing device from uh, used in the US census in the early 19 something or others. Uh, and uh, this was used to, 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 to calculate the, the, you know, the, the, the crunch the numbers for the census. Uh, this here is a picture of a computer. This was a person who was doing the computing. They didn't call the machine a computer in those days, the person doing it was the computer. And this is what, what the, the computer was creating, a little program on a punched card that the Hollerith machine would read in order to execute its algorithm. Interestingly, you can kind of capture that algorithm as a, as a SQL-like statement. And this is, this is the algorithm that it was trying to implement. Um, uh, and and that's, that, that's kind of interesting to me because what this is saying is that I, I think we would recognize this. I think we would imagine writing a piece of code like this if we were trying to solve a problem. So there's something about the granularity of expression of coding ideas that seems to be durable over a span of technology that's hard to imagine going from a really crude machine like this to the modern high-tech devices that we operate. So there's something going on here. The next thing that we should think about if we're thinking about what's going to happen in a uh, hundred years time is that it's us and not these things that are doing writing the computer programs. Um, if they're doing all of the programming, then some of my assumptions might, you know, might be a little bit off whack, but we'll, we'll explore that as we're going forward. So let's assume for the sake of this talk that what we're thinking about still has, you know, the part of the difficulty of writing software is that it still needs to fit inside a human head. And that's a feature of what it is that we need to get right if we're gonna achieve this. So, what sort of ideas are kind of durable on this kind of scale? So we could think about programming languages. Are programming languages durable over a hundred years time? Well, probably not, I think. What about programming frameworks? Those two, I'm not really sure that they're likely to be. Certainly frameworks and often languages. I, I'm sure that there will still be Java around in a hundred years time. I'm equally sure that there will be a hundred or a thousand other new languages that have sprung up between now and then. So why, why is it that the languages aren't the things that are going to make the big change? I think people like writing languages and frameworks, and so we, we, we create those and we have a lot of those sorts of things. If I'm honest, I think mostly it's about fashion. If you look at the kind of key ideas in, in software development terms, there haven't been that many big steps in terms of the things that we can do and uh, with the languages. Functional programming was, was, was it created many decades ago, ago. object-oriented programming similar, procedural programming similar. The kinds of approaches, the, the techniques that we have at our fingertips were established in the 1960s for the large part. And all we've done since then is kind of refine them in terms of 
in terms of the tools that we've used and built on top of them. So I'm not I'm not di um, uh, dissing the, the the languages that are available. There are some nice languages, but my argument is. My prediction is that there are going to be no big leaps in terms of productivity down to language or framework. Uh, and, and that's largely to do with this kind of granularity of information. We have to specify information, a specific resolution of, re resolution of detail in order to be able to encode it so that a computer can, can operate it. There's not going to be a massive change in the level of abstraction, uh, to my mind that kind of wins us a huge advantage. There are gonna be some special cases as there are today. We can go and do certain kinds of, you know, very uh, narrowly scoped kinds of programming, you know, programming a, a, a web page in WordPress or something like that versus, you know, writing, you know, writing a, a program in, 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 in a more conventional programming language. Um, but there's not going to be a big change in the level of abstraction, to my mind, unless we can expand the capacity of our heads, which we might well do. We, we may well you know, enhance our ability to retain things uh, in, in our own heads. What about programming paradigms? What about things like object orientation, functional programming, procedural programming, those sorts of ideas? I think that there's, there's, there's a limited degree to which these things may have an impact. Um, and but, but I, again, I think the huge steps probably not. So why why do I think that's the case? Um, to me, there seems to be something fundamental about this level of detail that we need to specify to write code. And this is a very risky prediction. But my prediction for a hundred years time is that pro programming will still be procedural. It will still encompass some object orientation, and it will still be functional in parts. These techniques are useful in different contexts, and they offer us different advantages. New programming paradigms may be added, and one of the gaps that seems to me is that most of the systems that I see and am involved with, you know have the idea of services as part of those and those are not those, those are not ideas that surface at the level of programming languages and I, I expect uh, that in terms of programming paradigm people will invent something that kind of allows us to talk about services and encode services uh, more than we do today as a common part of our development practice we're currently missing that kind of level of abstraction and I want to do a little bit of sidebar. I'm, I, I'm an old school OO practitioner. I, I, I make no bones of that. And it's a bit of a current fashion to day and play the value and impact of object orientation on the industry. I've heard people say things like OO failed. And I think that's just because they don't recognize what really happened. Object orientation was an enabling step in creating bigger, more complex systems. The reasons that we have the operating systems that we have and the kind of the, the approach to uh, hiding information between parts of the system is largely down to object oriented thinking. And I think it also gives us kind of an organizational approach that allows us to navigate pro complex problem sort spaces that, that are lacking in other approaches, uh, to my view. And so I think it has it has a place. I don't think it, I don't think it should replace any of the others, but I think it, it lives alongside them. One idea that, that, that's very close to my heart, I'm, I, I'm a long time practitioner of test driven development. So do I think that test driven development will be you know, still around in 100 years time and driving developments? Well, again, I, I kind of encode this as sort of orange rather than red in that I hope so. I, I hope that it is. Um, I think this is important. I believe that test driven development is one of the few genuine disciplines that we can genuinely consider to be an engineering discipline in the way in which we approach solving problems in software. We use the tests as executable specification to cross check the work that we're doing. Without that, we're kind of guessing and we're just kind of crossing our fingers and hoping that the software works. Um, so my very, very risky pr prediction is that when a kindergarten child learns to write her first line of code in, in 100 years' time, it will be done in the context of test room development. At least that's what I hope is the case, because I think that's a better would be a better way of teaching it. 
Some other ideas that are, kind, that, that are, I think, to my mind, much more durable and more profound. I think that software is deeply about learning. It's uh, one of the mistakes that we have made is to try and think of software development as an exercise in production engineering. It is not. We never have a production problem, but we always have a learning problem. So we should be focusing on becoming world-class practitioners at learning. And if we want to do that, we need to take iteration seriously. I think this is an idea that is not going to go away. We need to take feedback seriously. We need to gather information back to where we're finding it so that we can inspect and adapt. We need to work incrementally, thinking in terms of modularity of systems and being able to build up systems piece by piece and step by step over time. We need to be working experimentally because that's how you do real learning in the real world rather than just guessing what the answer is to something. We carry out little experiments and we need to be empirical. We need to be measuring things in the context of the real world so that we can understand um, how they land in the world and how, they, and, and how they really work. So I think that these five things for me are keys to become, becoming you know, much, much better at learning. And for me, this is really talking about applying scientific style reasoning and thinking to software development. So why do I think this is the case? These are foundational concepts to me. They're, they're grounded in our need to learn and deepen our understanding. Even if the machines are writing the code, my belief is that these things will still be true. They will still be applying these techniques because this is how you apply, this is the best way that we understand of uh, learning and, uh, and creating a more, more complex understanding uh, in, in complex systems. This is how science works. The other part of software development that's interesting is managing the complexity of the problem so that it fits inside a human being's head. And for that, we need a different kind of properties. We need to think in terms of modularity. I think this too is a durable idea. Separation of concerns, being able to isolate the system uh, you know, functionally into, into pieces that are focused on doing one thing well. Information hiding, making sure that information doesn't leak between different parts of the system and abstraction um, so, that, uh, so that we can, uh, again, layer the system and, and hide, hide leakages uh, between different par parts of the system and think about them in pieces. And cohesion, keeping the things that are, that are related close together, keeping the things that are unrelated far apart. These ideas are based on our need to compose ideas into pieces that are small enough to fit into a human head. So my prediction is even if we are mechanically extending our cognitive function, we will still need to partition the problems to fit into our new expanded heads. So these two are going to be the kinds of ideas that are going to be durable in 100 years time. I'm fair, my name is associated with continuous delivery. I was one of the authors of the continuous delivery book and, and I believe that continuous delivery is probably in this space because I think it's the application of a lot of the ideas that I've already just talked about. I think that continuous delivery will be a long lasting idea. So why do I believe that to be true? Continuous delivery is based on the application of the scientific method to software development. It's about establishing fast, efficient feedback loops so that we can learn. It rests on iteration, feedback, incremental development, experiment, an empirical discovery. So the foundations for learning are there. So my prediction is even if the machines are writing the code, they're going to adopt continuous delivery. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Dave, can you take a question from the audience? With pleasure. Um, of course, yeah. So what would be a good way to archive information for the future so it doesn't get lost? Durable's data storage <laughs> today and plans to prever preserve info. So what's, uh, that's a good question. Um, it is, it's a hard one. <laughs> I said, uh, etching it on stone seems to have been the one that's worked quite well. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know what, the, what, what an answer is in terms of this. I think, the, I, I think where we are at the moment, um, 
as long as our high-tech civilization lasts, which if we're still going to be programming in, in 100 years' time, then, then putting stuff in the cloud on the internet is probably a good idea because we're going to keep revving, revving that and changing how that works in the storage. One of the things that's kind of interesting to me in terms of long-term storage changes and the impact it's going to have on the software development, slightly off topic, slightly not answering the question, is the idea of, of massive scale non-volatile RAM because that's really going to change the game. It's going to really change the way that we think about and practice software development, I think. So that's kind of exciting, an exciting idea. Um, but no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think if you really want, if you want to really want to cover your bets, then uh, carving it into stone is uh, is the most durable thing that we've found as a species so far. Are there any more questions? So far, we don't, we have a few seconds left. I think. Oh yeah, and the questions are so. I think no. I think we don't have time for any more questions, Dave. But okay. thank you so much for your talk and for sharing that with us. And maybe if you have more questions, uh, since do you do you like to take questions on Twitter? Sure, by all means, contacts on Twitter. Sign up for my YouTube channel. All good. <laughs> yeah, check them out and uh, and keep the conversation going and hashtag Spinnaker Live so we all know it was part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.